So today I'm going to talk about a suite of tools that are used to understand genomics broadly, the fields of genomics, proteomics, and a suite of other omics, <laughs> which I'm not really going to get into. But um, all right, so what genomics is, is it's a field that we can think of it in two different ways. We can think of it in terms of structural genomics, which is largely about trying to understand the structures of genomes. How many chromosomes are there? How are they, how are genes distributed on those chromosomes? What is the number of genes in the genome? Um, are they clustered on certain chromosomes? Um, questions like that. Um, and also as well as gene content, um, sequence content, are there DC rich regions, are there large expanses of repetitive DNA, what are the intron sizes like? Because all of these characteristics of genomes vary depending on the species and are hallmarks of that species past evolution. So it tells us something about the evolutionary history of those species. Um, so that would be structural genomics. Another aspect of genomics is functional genomics, where we seek to understand the relationship between phenotype and genotype on a genomic scale. So for example, if we are trying to understand the genetic basis for development of wing patterns in butterflies, for example, we might use a genomic approach where we are essentially probing the entire genome for signatures of information that tell us which genes might be expressed during wing development. Um, and I'll talk about how we might actually go about doing that. What are the methods involved? So um, this lecture is also technically called genomics and proteomics. Um, I may just change that to genomics in the future because genomics is kind of a catchword. We are no longer only interested in the genome. We are also interested in the transcriptome, what RNA is transcribed in a certain type of cell or organ or tissue at a certain developmental time point. Um, so for example, what, are, what transcripts are expressed by the genome within developing wing buds of a butterfly, of a caterpillar. And then proteomics um, is just, you know, what are all the proteins that are there? So we can characterize a number of different types of omics based on, you know, characterizing everything of a certain thing. So we can characterize the metabolome, um, which is, you know, what are all the metabolites that are within a certain tissue at a certain time. Anyway, so it's a big field and I'm only going to treat it with very broad brush strokes just to kind of give you an introduction to the kinds of things that we can do, the kinds of questions that we can answer, and how we might start to go about doing that. So um, one big tool in genomics is linkage maps. And linkage maps, remember way back when to that chapter when I made you do the linkage mapping um, and you had this cross and you were trying to identify order of genes and distances, that's a linkage map. Now, we no longer necessarily, we do still use linkage maps to some degree that are generated the way you did just by counting progeny and calculating number of recombination events um, to determine how relatively how far apart different genes are from each other. So um, that was sort of the old fashioned way. That's what Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab was doing. And, um, and people still do that today in a number of organisms, which we call maybe not model organisms, where we don't necessarily have a lot of genomic information for them. And so we still use linkage maps. Um, most of the time, though, we're using physical maps, where we really just sequence the whole dang thing and figure out where genes are that way. We sequence it, we assemble it, and I'll talk about that process as well. Um, and so there can be some fairly significant differences between the physical map and the linkage map, um, what we call maybe the, the genetic map. And so for example, here on the right, we have a genetic map that was generated using 
um, number of recombinations, uh, re recombination events between pairs of genes. And on the left, we have that same chromosome. This is chromosome three from the human genome. Um, that was generally, you know what, I'm not even, is this human? I would, ugh, I guess, uh, yeah. Um, and so, so also looking at the, there are a number of different, the gene order is the same. So we got that right. But the relative dis differences, well, here the gene order got switched. So, um, so sometimes we have it, you know, not super right. Um, histone 4 seems pretty good. Um, so there are some differences. So we, if we can, we tend to want to use the physical map rather than the genetic map because it is more accurate. Okay. Um, so linkage maps, what are they good for? They help you figure out, they, they provide a, almost a template, a, a, a map, like literally. So if you have a gene that you're not sure where it is, but you know that it is, it is um, genetically linked. It's always associated with certain allele. And nowadays, um, linkage maps are often used with, rather than actual genes, they're used with SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, which I will talk about later because they're super important in genomic research. Um, so let's say you have a new gene that you're not sure where it is, but you know that it's always associated with a certain SNP variant. And if you know, if you have a map of where that SNP variant is, you have a pretty good idea of where that gene is also. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a map. Um, okay, so linkage maps are, genetic maps are, the linkage maps are limited uh, in resolution. So there's only so close together we can get and there's only so far apart we can get estimating things through, through recombination rates. Whereas the physical distance is obviously much more accurate. Okay, so the very first genome to be sequenced is from bacteriophage lambda in 1982, which was like 30 years ago. And um, the first free living organism to be sequenced, so phage is a virus, um, but the first free living organism to be sequenced was a bacterium hemophilus influenzae in 1995. And, um, and this is a representation of that genome. And you can see all these restriction sites um, in the genome, there are, um, this is sort of the scale of it in, in, in base pairs, so how big it is. So it's about, you know, something on the order of 1.8 million bases. Um, and, and we have just different ways that we can characterize a genome, including, um, so these are restriction sites. Um, we can indicate, you know, where genes are that have different functions and different, um, we can characterize them based on percent content of different like GC richness or versus AT richness um, because the, the genome is heterogeneous. It, it varies um, depending on where you are in it. Um, here we see coverage of where, the, what the clones that were used in sequencing, which I'll talk about in a minute, so they used cloning for this. And, um, and then here we have diff where um, ribosomal operons and tRNA genes and then prophage are located. And then here we have the, a pattern of, of where we have simple tandem repeats, which there aren't too many. Okay, so we can, these are just different ways in which we can characterize a very tiny, simple genome. All right, so the human genome, not tiny or simple. Um, and it's been kind of a goal of the scientific community for a number of years now to develop a method for sequencing the human genome for only $1,000. It's like the $1,000 genome, which was, you know, 10 years ago thought to be this pipe dream. And um, maybe I'll skip ahead. So apparently last year, Illumina the Illumina platform came out with um, the HiSeq X10 system, which consists of 10 ultra-high throughput sequencers. Um, 
which were designed for human whole genome sequencing. And between 10 of these, if you buy 10 of them for like $10 million, then you can get human genomes for $1,000. Um, there are a few uh, institutions out there who are doing this and um, human, like, human genome sequencing for the purpose of, um, of individualized medicine is becoming incredibly important. And it's always been sort of like, oh, that would be so cool if we could do that because then we could target treatments specifically for a person's biology. Um, and it's becoming especially important in cancer treatment because every which we'll talk about, I think next week when we talk about cancer, cancer is like both horrifying and fascinating because every cancer is different because it's, it's largely derived from random mutations. And every mutation is different. The way that cancer arises is different. And so not every treatment is going to work for everyone. And, um, and if we can sequence tumor cells in somebody um, for $1,000, then you can have an individualized treatment that is much more effective. And this has been done and has been successful in a few patients. Um, so it's a really exciting new um, possibility for you know, clinical treatment of, of certain diseases. Okay, let me back up. All right, so that's, that's sort of human genome sequencing we're right now, and I'll talk about how exactly that all happens. But I'm going to go back in time and explain how we used to do it. So the Human Genome Project started um, about maybe 12 years ago now. And um, it took $3 billion in almost 10 years. So the idea of having a human genome for $1,000 in three days is pretty amazing. Um, so the human genome project was okay so the the human sequence of the human genome was done <clears throat> by two different groups one was the human genome project which was this consortium international consortium of different researchers at different universities and institutions and research institutions um teaming together to sequence the human genome then halfway through that project a startup group called Cellular Genomics that was led by Craig Venter said, we're gonna sequence the human genome too. And we're gonna do it better and faster and we're gonna beat you. And so there became this kind of race between the Human Genome Pro Project and Cellera to sequence the human genome. And what the Human Genome Project was doing was they were using map-based sequencing. And what this means is that they were taking the entire chromosome, let's say, the entire genome, they were digesting it into smaller sequences, and then they were um, basically uh, digesting, you know, so they would digest the, the DNA, and they would take these sequences and they would map them. Okay, so they, let me start over. Okay, so they fragmented it they subcloned these fragments. Oh, you know what? Let me hold on. Let me just check this out for a second. So, okay, so the map-based sequencing was kind of a two or multi-step thing where they would have these fairly large chunks of DNA that were then cloned using a vector that could handle much, like really, really big chunks, um, like a yeast or artificial chromosome, a yak. And so they would clone these, these fragments, and then each of these large clones would then be extracted, digested, and subcloned to generate a map. So for each of these big fragments, they would generate a map using restriction enzymes um, of, you know, a restriction map is essentially what they did for each, each of these clones. So they would, for each um, bit larger clone in a yak, they would cut it up, subclone it, um, do Sanger sequencing on it, and then eventually assemble back a larger idea of, of what a series of these fairly large clones um, were. And so 
it was 